What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. Imagine you're working on a smart home automation app and your current task is to allow the users of this application to switch on or off the lights of any room inside the house. So you went ahead and represented each room with a class and made them extend the room class where our common code will sit. Inside this class we can add the light class as every room created should have lights. Then the functionality we require, which is turning on the lights of a particular room if they are off and turning off the lights if they are on, can sit inside the room class. Now, when we create a specific house for a particular client, which consists of a list of rooms basically, the client can choose to switch on or off the lights of any room he or she desires. Okay, our code is clean and neat. We even applied the open-closed principle by separating each room into a different class. So in the future, if we introduce a functionality that is specific to living rooms, for example, we can add it to the living room class without affecting other parts of our application. However, some of you might have realized that this approach is deeply flawed. First, you have an enormous number of subclasses, and each time you modify the lights logic in the base room class, you risk breaking the code in these subclasses. To relate to this, suppose that the owner equipped sensors for his bathrooms, so he no longer needs our app to turn on and off the lights in his bathrooms. While our app as it is right now does not give him the flexibility to remove this feature for a specific room, because the bathroom class extends the room class and the business logic for turning on and off lights is implemented inside the base class of all our rooms. And here's the ugliest part. The operations you are invoking might need to be called from multiple places, like not just from the house rooms we created. What I mean by that is, suppose the application we are developing can now switch any light in the house, not just room lights. So if we add a floor lamp in the living room and want to use our application to turn it on and off, we can't let the floor lamp class extend the room class because simply it's not a room. Therefore, we will have to duplicate the lights logic we wrote for rooms inside the floor lamp class. To avoid this, what we can do is first move the light switching logic from the room and floor lamp classes to the light class itself. By doing this, we encapsulated the light switching logic inside the light class, so that any time we change this logic, it will be modified across all the parts of our application. Okay, now our business logic is nicely separated from the rest of our code, but we still have the previous problem. We still have several classes that are calling this logic and switching lights themselves, and this violates the single responsibility principle. To solve this, what you have to do is extract all of the request details, such as the object being called, the name of the method, and the list of arguments passed to this method, into a separate class with a single method that triggers this request. Classes such as this one host repeated behaviors in our applications, and are referred to as commands. Now, in this example, our rooms and our floor lamp, as well as any other object we might create, will have a command object as an attribute and an execute command method inside it. And when we need to switch the light in any of these objects, we set this command to be the switch lights command and execute it. Or maybe later on we can expand on this and pass the list of commands, like a close or open curtains command, an open or closed door command, you see? The possibilities for extension are endless, and on top of that, every class has its own responsibility now, as we manage to decouple the classes that invoke operations from the classes that actually perform these operations. The decisions, the assignments, and the configuration of our program is now decided at runtime by the client, giving him way more flexibility on how and what to do with the objects at hand. And that's what the command pattern is all about. This pattern is a behavioral design pattern that turns a request or a behavior into a standalone object that contains everything about that request. It is used to encapsulate all the relevant information needed to perform an action or trigger an event, so that this action may be reused by several parts of our application. Okay, let's go ahead now and take a look at the structure or class diagram of the command design pattern, all while relating it to the house automation example we gave at the beginning of the video. The first thing you will notice here is, of course, the command interface. This interface usually declares a single method for executing the command. Next are the concrete commands, which can implement various kinds of requests. These classes can perform the work on their own, or can pass the call to one of the business logic objects in our application, just like we did in our previous example. 
Now, two terms always associated with a command pattern are the invoker, aka sender, and the receiver. The invoker is responsible for initiating requests. This class must have a field for storing a reference to a command object. The sender triggers that command instead of sending the request directly to the receiver. In our example, the rooms of the house were the sender or invoker. However, the receiver class contains some business logic. Almost any object may act as a receiver. Most commands only handle the details of how a request is passed to the receiver, while the receiver itself does the actual work. And that is exactly what was happening in the light class, which was the receiver in our example. The command we created was redirecting the call of the room class to the light class and telling it that it should switch its lights. But the actual switching, the actual business logic, was being done inside the light class and not inside the command itself. Finally, the last piece of our class diagram is the client. Its responsibility is creating and configuring concrete command objects. The client must pass all of the request parameters, including a receiver instance, into the command's constructor. So, to sum everything up, the command design pattern will turn a specific method call into a standalone object. And by doing that, you will open a lot of interesting uses, such as passing commands as method arguments, storing them inside other objects, or even switching linked commands at runtime. But that's not all. An additional use of commands can be found among the queuing and scheduling. You see, commands, similarly to any other object, can be serialized, making it very easy to write it to and read it from a file or a database. Consequently, this object can be scheduled, queued, logged, or even sent over the network. So, that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Take care, and I will see you in the next one.